Hello, Saddleback. Welcome to 40 Days of Prayer. And if you'll take out your message notes. Now, the first couple weeks, we were just getting uh, the materials distributed to all the small groups. This week, we actually start thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of small groups. In fact, we have over 1,000 new groups just starting uh, during 40 Days of Prayer. And so welcome to you. If you're not in a group, you need to go out and get the materials to start one with a couple of people. And uh, if you're in a group and your host hasn't picked them up, tell them they're going to hell. And that they, if they're a good host, they'll pick it up today because we want to be on schedule because the messages that I'm teaching in the small group and the messages I'm doing on the weekend from now on interlap. And you're going to miss half of the, half of the teaching uh, if you're not in a small group. You know, one of the things that irritates me most is when people call you on the phone and they don't identify themselves. You know what I'm talking about? They just call and they just start talking. You're supposed to be like, I'm supposed to know who this is? When you don't know who's on the other end, it affects your conversation a whole lot. You don't know what you're gonna say. You're a little more guarded. You don't know what tone to use. Is this the Pope or the pizza guy? <laughs> uh, you don't know what words are appropriate. You don't know how to dress them properly. If you don't know much about the person, you're, you're more formal. I can always tell people who are part of Saddleback when I'm out in the neighborhood and those who aren't. Because I'll be pushing my cart down the aisle in the grocery store and say, hey, Pastor Rick, how's it going? But when someone says, hello, Reverend Warren. <laughs> you talking to me? <laughs> Moi? You clearly don't know me if you just call me Reverend. Okay. So... Uh, Proximity and relationship determines how you talk to somebody. What you know about somebody determines your conversation. Now the same is true with God. I wrote at the top of your outline there, your understanding of what God is really like shapes everything else in your life, including your prayer. Nothing influences your life uh, more than how you view God. Now a lot of people have misconceptions about God. I made a list here, some people think God is the grumpy God. You know, cranky, angry, upset all the time, never can please him. Some people have the crouching tiger God, ready to pounce on you when you make the wrong move. Some people have the flaky father God, he's moody, he changes his mind continually about you. Some people think of God as the cosmic cop, that the whole goal of God is just make sure you keep the rules. And who wants to talk to to that, or a dictator God, always demanding more and more and more and it's never enough. Or the Santa Claus God where he's making a list and checking it twice. Are you naughty or nice? Some people have what I call the Play-Doh God, which is you make him into any form you want. It's kind of like our Mr. Potato Head God, that would be a better one. You know, you can put them all together. I like to think of God as, well, I'm sorry, it doesn't really matter what you like to think when it comes to God. It's what is he really like, not what you like to think of him as because you're just guessing. It's extremely important that you know the real God. If you, don't, if you have a misconception about God, prayer is gonna be a duty, a drudgery, it's gonna be boring, it's something I have to do, I've got to do, I should do, I must do. And guilt motivation doesn't work, folks. So you don't guilt yourself into praying and God doesn't want you to pray out of guilt. You gotta have the right concept of God. A.W. Tozer wrote, what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Because it affects everything else in your life. So what is God really like? Well, God has many characteristics. He is all-knowing, um, uh, omniscient. He is all-powerful, omnipotent. He is uh, omnipresent. It means he can be everywhere at the same time. The Bible tells us God is holy, God is just, God is kind, God is loving, God is faithful. There are many, many characteristics of God uh, that we have done studies about before, but I want us this morning to just look at the goodness of God. Because it is the goodness of God that is the basis for all prayer. If God is not a good God, you have zero reason to pray. You have zero motivation to pray. Now, the only reason there's any good in the world is because God is a good God and God is a creator and his goodness is in the universe. You can't spell good without God. 
If there's no God, there is no good. There's no right or wrong. There's no good and bad. People say, why is there evil in the world? Real simple, God doesn't force us to do good. All the evil in the world is because God gave us a free choice and we choose not to do good a lot of the time. And so do a lot of other people. And that causes all the evil in the world. Evil is really easy to explain. The hard thing to explain is why is there good in the world? If you believe in you know, random chance and survival of the fittest, then everything should be. Whoever, dog eat dog, whoever wins, that's just tough luck. The only reason there's good in the world is because God is a good God. Now, because God is always good, we know four things about prayer. And I want you to understand these because when you understand how good God really is, you're gonna enjoy prayer. It's not a duty, it's a, it's a delight. When any time prayer becomes ritual boring to you, it's because you don't understand how good God is. People say, well, I just don't love God enough. No, that's not your problem. Your problem is you don't understand how much God loves you and how good God is to you. Everything in your life is a gift of God's goodness. But let's look at four implications of the goodness of God in your life and how that's gonna change the way you pray from now on, all right? Number one, because God is always good, God's plans for my life will always be good. Because God is always good. God is in, people say, is there anything God can't do? There are a lot of things God can't do. He can't deny himself. He can't be evil. God is good, so by nature he cannot do evil. He cannot do bad. Everything God does is good. And so because God is good, God's plans for my life will always be good. Now I want us to look at some scripture. Jeremiah chapter 29 says this, verse 11. God's talking. I know what I've planned for you, says the Lord. I have good plans for you. Not plans to hurt you. My plans will give you a hope and a good future. There's that word again. And when you call to me and you pray, I will listen to you. You see the connection between purpose and prayer? Between God's plans for your life and prayer? Now I've said this many times. You're not an accident. There's a purpose for your life. There are accidental parents, but there are no accidental children. Your parents may not have planned you, but God did. And, and he wanted you alive. Now, God didn't have to create a plan for your life. He could have just let you be born and have no plan. He could have just let you be born. He doesn't necessarily have a plan for every ant, for every mosquito, except to bug you. <laughs> but God has never made anything without a purpose, really. Everything has a purpose and has a plan. God could have created you without a plan, but he gave a plan for your life, why? Because he loves you, he loves you. He is a good God. And he put a lot of thought into creating you. And he said, well, how do I know God's plan? God's plan for your life are revealed, God's plan is revealed, and it is realized through prayer. The more you pray, the more you're gonna understand God's plan for your life. He says there, I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you, to give you hope, to give you a good future, and when you call to me and pray to me, I will listen to you. Look up here on the screen, the Bible says this. David says in Psalm 31, God, your goodness is so great. Everything God, good in your life is a gift of God. Everything good in your life. God, your goodness is so great. You've stored up great blessings for those who honor you. Now notice it says stored up. That include, that means God thought about it. It means intentional thought in advance. When you store up something, you plan it in advance. Did you know that God has already planned the blessings he has for the rest of your life? Why? He's a good God. God, your goodness is so great, you stored up great blessings. I haven't even got them all yet for those who honor you. You do so much for those who come to you for protection blessing them before the watching world. That's why we're doing 40 days of prayer. I want God to bless your life before the, before the watching world. But you can miss those blessings. They're not automatic. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. You gotta learn to ask, you gotta learn to pray. And it is prayer that reveals your purpose and your plan, God's plan for your life, and it's prayer that reveals and, and, and uh, shows you the, the blessings in your life. You have not because you ask not. 
I want you to experience those blessings. So God says, everything I do in your life is good. I don't have any bad plans for you. They're not plans to hurt you. People say, mm, God's getting even with me. God does not get even with people. I've said this many times. God is not mad at you. He's mad about you. He says, I'm a good God. I have good plans for your life. Other people have bad plans for your life. And you may make some bad plans yourself. But God has good plans for your life. You say, well, Rick, not everything in my life is good. God didn't promise that. He didn't say everything that happens in your life will be good. He says, I have good plans for you. You can miss God's plans by your own decisions. God did not promise that everything in your life would have a happy ending. Friends, we live on a broken planet. Everything on this planet is broken. Nothing's perfect. Nothing works perfectly. Your body is broken. Have you noticed that? It, it, it doesn't always work the right way. Your mind is broken. It always doesn't think the right way. The weather's broken, the economy's broken, relationships are broken, everything on this planet, nothing is perfect. So God didn't say, I, I promise you perfection. That's called heaven. And we're, this is not, we should not expect heaven to be on earth. In heaven, no sorrow, sadness, sickness, suffering. But here, there is brokenness. But God says, even in the middle of all this brokenness, I have a good plan for your life. And he, and he, and he says, I'm, even when you make bad choices, I'm greater than your choices. And I can even fit the dumb decisions you've made into a good plan. What a God. He can turn crucifixions into resurrections. Romans 8, 28. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. If you say, God, I gave you my life, Jesus, I wanna have a relationship with you. I wanna fulfill the purpose you made me for. This is not a promise for everybody in the world. Everything is not working together for good for everybody in the world. Everything is working together for good for those who give it all to God. And he says those who are saying, God, I want your plan, your purpose for my life. It doesn't say all things are good. It says they all work together. Even the bad and even the bitter. God says, I can put that in the mix. Yeah, I'm gonna throw that in too. I've used this illustration before that when you make a cake, the individual ingredients don't taste good. Flour by itself does not taste good. Raw eggs do not taste good. Vanilla by itself does not taste good. Uh, baking powder, baking soda doesn't taste good. Uh, all these, oil, Crisco does not taste good. But you put them all together and let God work them together. That's called batter. I like that. <laughs> God wants to take the bitter, put it in the batter, and make you better. <laughs> I've never said that. Somebody should tweet it. Okay? I'm going to say it again. That's pretty good. <laughs> God takes the bitter, put it in the batter, and makes you better. In sweet and sour sauce, that tastes pretty good, but sour by itself, uh-uh. But God can fix it all together. Why? Because he's a good God. He's a good God. Now, the more you pray, the better you're gonna know your purpose. And the better you know your purpose, the more God can use everything in your life, even the stuff that plan, people plan against you. You know the story of Joseph in the Bible, where his brothers sold him into slavery, but he ends up being second in command in Egypt, and years later he confronts his brothers, and he says in Genesis 50, 20, your plan was to hurt me, but God turned your evil plan into a good plan to save the lives of many people. That's called redemptive suffering. Sometimes you suffer for the benefit of other people. That's what Jesus did for you. When he died on the cross, that's redemptive suffering. He, didn't, he wasn't paying for his sins, he didn't have any. He's paying for yours. And sometimes, like in Joseph's case, God takes the, the bitter and he makes the world better because of what you went through. God says, it's not all good in your life, but I can use it all for good and fit it into the plan. Even the hurts and the sins of other people, even when you're an innocent person and you've been hurt by others, was that good? No, it was not good when you were hurt. But God, can God use it for good? Yes, because God is a good God. And he loves to bring 
good out of bad. Anybody can bring good out of good. God brings good out of bad. So the more you trust the goodness of God, the happier you're gonna be, Romans 5, 3. So we can rejoice when we run into problems and trials. What? That sounds kind of masochistic. Oh, happy day, I'm in a problem. He says, we can rejoice when we even run into problems. You can be happy even in the middle of pressure and trials and troubles and tribulation. Why? Notice the phrase, for we know. Circle the phrase, for we know. Happiness in life depends on what you know, not what you go through. You can take two people, put them through the same circumstance, one of them's happy, one of them's devastated. Why? Because it's what you know. What you know makes a difference. We can, we can be rejoicing when we run into problems and trials, for we know, here's what, what do we know? That they're good for us, why? Because God is a good God. And God says, I'll even use the bad stuff in your life for good, if you'll let me. Doesn't happen with everybody. If you'll let me, I'll use the bad for good in your life. We know that they're good for us. They help us learn patient endurance. God's much more interested in your character, what you become, than your comfort. You're not taking your car to heaven, your cash to heaven, your career to heaven, your china to heaven, you are taking your character. The only thing you're taking to heaven is you. God wants to grow it here on earth before he takes it into eternity. How does he do it? Through all these different things. And he says, I'll, I'll use it all, I'm a good God. And he says, everything that God does in my life, he says, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use it for good. On earth, God's more interested in your character. This is not heaven. So don't expect life to be perfect, it's not. But he says, I can even bring good out of bad. Now I want you to write this sentence down. Everything God does in my life, he does for my good. God's not trying to get even with you. God is trying to grow you. Everything God does in my life, he does for my good. Because he is a good God. So that's the first thing that we learn. That God's plans for my life will always be good because God is a good God. He doesn't have bad plans for your life. The more you get to know God, the more you understand God's plans. All right, number two, second pillar of God's goodness. Because God is always good, God always gives me what I need, not what I deserve. God always gives me what I need, not what I deserve. <laughs> If you and I got what we deserved, we wouldn't even be here. Psalm 103 says this, verse 10 and verse 12. He, God, has not treated us as we deserve. He's not treated us as we deserve for our sins or paid us back for our wrongs. Why? Because Jesus Christ paid for all your sins and all your wrongs. And if you had to pay for your own sins and wrongs, then why did Jesus die on the cross? That's called double jeopardy. If you put your trust in Christ, all your sins have been paid for. So why would you have to pay for them? He's already paid for them. He's not treated us as we deserve for our sins paid us back for our wrongs. In his goodness, this is what he's saying, he has taken our sins away and removed them as far as the east is from the west. I like that he says from the east to the west because there's no end to east and west. There is a North Pole, there is a South Pole, they, there's an ending to those. But he says, God takes your sins and he just wipes them out. One verse in the Bible says he puts them in the deepest part of the sea, metaphorically. And then he puts up a no fishing sign. <laughs> you, you need to stop dragging them. If God has forgiven you, you need to forgive yourself. Now, God is good, he gives me what I need, not what I deserve. This guy in the Bible, David, King David, commits adultery, and then to cover it up, he has the wife's husband murdered. Pretty big sense. Murder and adultery, right up, right up there at the top. Did David deserve to be forgiven? No. Did David deserve mercy? No. But David knows that God is a good God. And so he asks for mercy. Here's what he prays, Psalm 51. If you are in a big sin right now, you need to go read Psalm 51. God, in your goodness, 
Have mercy on me. Not because I deserve it, because you're a good God. Have mercy on me. Wash away all my guilt. Make me clean again from my sins. Sin, cleanse me. All of that is based on who God is, not who you are. Let me make this real clear to you. God forgives you, not because you're good. God forgives you because he's good. It's not based on your goodness. You think, well, if I'm just so good in this area, then God will forgive me. Uh Uh-uh, won't happen, Doesn't, doesn't matter. God forgives you not because of your goodness. God forgives you because he is a good God. He has a plan, and that's a good plan, and when you blow it and you, and you need forgiveness, he gives forgiveness, because he is a good God. Now, here's the new, cool thing about this. Not only does God forgive your sins, when you come and ask, say, God, I know you're a good God, you're a merciful God, I ask you to show me mercy, I ask you to forgive my sin. Not only does he forgive us, he welcomes you back. Now, this is a big deal. He, he does not reject you when you sin. He receives you back. This is the exact opposite of what people do. When you hurt somebody, when you sin against them, do they want to receive you back? Absolutely not. They want to be standoff. They want to be distant. They want to push you away. They want to reject you, not receive you. And yet God says, even when you sin, because I am a good God, I will receive you. I will not reject you. Unlike, God is unlike people in this. Now, I'm a pastor, and I've been a pastor a long time. I've talked to tens of thousands of people, so I know your little secret. I know your, some of you said, I'm leaving right now. (laughs) And I'm gonna put it on the screen here in just a minute. (laughs) No, I'm a good pastor. (laughs) What I know about every one of you is one of your deepest fears is the fear of rejection, and you do almost anything in, you, in your life to avoid it. You don't want to be rejected by anybody, you want everybody to like you and love you, and you don't want anybody to think you're a doofus. So you say, I'm not gonna get out on that dance field, you know, on that dance hall at that, at that wedding, I can't dance. Because some of us look at it and they go, look how stupid she looks. And you do, much of your life you've planned in order to avoid rejection. I don't do these certain things, I don't go to these certain places, I only have these certain friends, I I limit my life because I don't wanna be rejected. It is a deep, deep fear that you have. The fear of somebody finding out what you're really like. Years ago there was a book called Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Am? And the answer is, because if I tell you what I'm really like and you don't like it, I'm up a creek without a paddle because I'm all I've got. So we, we spend most of our lives wearing masks, pretending to be people we're not. Because if you really let people see what you really are, you're afraid they would reject you. It's one of your deepest fears. But because God, listen, is good, and always good, and never bad, God will never, 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 never reject you. Even when you sin against God him and you hurt him and you don't do what he's told you to do you can come back he will receive you not reject you just come back to him humbly look at this next verse Psalm 27 verses 10 to 13 even if my father and mother abandon me some of you have been rejected by your parents you're no longer my son get out of my life I don't want to see you again you've hurt me too much or whatever Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. Do you hear the tenderness in that verse? Everybody wants to be held close. God will hold you close. Everybody will hold you. He says, David says, my enemies are waiting for me to fail. They they want me to fall. And and they know I'm a sinner. They know I'm imperfect. My enemies are waiting. So they can just say, da-da-da-da-da-da. See, you did it. Yet he says, even if my mother and father abandon me and my enemies are against me, yet I will remain confident. Why? Look at the rest of the verse. I remain confident that I'll see the goodness of the Lord while I'm living here in the world. You messed up, 
you screwed up, you made a big mistake, God is the God of the second chance. Why? He is a good, good father. He's good and gracious. Now, because God is always good and God is always gracious, when we pray, we can be always bold and always confident. We don't have to come slinking into God with our tail between our legs and kind of, you know, mousy because we know. We just come and say, God, you knew I blew it, but you are a good father. It's who you are. And this is who I am, but it's who you are that matters. God is good and gracious always, so we can be bold and confident always in prayer. You don't have to slink around and say, I wonder if I should pray this or not. Pray anything you want to pray about, and God will hear it. Hebrews chapter four, in the Bible, verse 15 and 16. The Bible says, Jesus, talking about Jesus, understands our weaknesses. In fact, God knows your weaknesses better than you do. He even knows the weaknesses you have that you don't even know are weak. Jesus understands our weaknesses and our temptations, for he faced all of the same temptations that we do here on earth, yet he did not sin, because he was perfect. So, let us come boldly with confidence. Circle that, boldly with confidence. Let us come boldly with confidence to the throne of our gracious, our good God. He's talking about prayer. And there we will receive his mercy and we will find the grace to help us when we need it, all right? So, how do I know God is good? Because everything he does in the world is good. God's plan for my life will always be good. He's not gonna steer me in the wrong direction. I will steer myself in the wrong direction, but he won't. And God always gives me what I need, not what I deserve. So when I need forgiveness, he doesn't give me judgment because of what Jesus did on the cross. Now here's the third one. Third factor for God's goodness. Because God is always good, this almost sounds like heresy, but it's right out of the scripture. God puts my good above his own good. Because God is always, always good. He puts my good even above his own good. Friends, this is the heart of the gospel. This is the good news, that the king sacrifices himself for the peasants. The reason I know that the Bible is true rather than a fairy tale, because in the fairy tales, everybody dies for the king. Protect the king at all costs. Protect the queen at all costs. Protect the princess at all costs. And all the peons and the peasants and the slaves and the soldiers, everybody's dying to protect the king. There's only one story in the world where the king dies for the people. It's called the gospel. This is what makes our faith different from every other storyline in the the world. God says, you've sinned, you deserve punishment, you deserve to go to hell, but I'm a good God and I love you. But I'm also holy and just Somebody's gotta pay for your sins. So here's the deal, I'll do it. I'll pay for your sins. I will come to earth as the son of God, Jesus Christ, and I will die for your sins. You're not dying for mine, I'm dying for yours. God doesn't have any sins. This is the gospel. This is the king sacrifices himself for the peasants. This is the ultimate expression of love. The shepherd dies for the sheep. Look at this next verse. Jesus says, John 10, I am the good, there's that word, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me and I will sacrifice my life for the sheep. Really? That's unbelievable. That's almost too good to to be true. I'm gonna stumble over that. You're you're gonna die for me, the shepherd. If any of you had a flock sheep, would you die for your sheep? Absolutely not. No shepherd in history has died for his sheep. They're just sheep. But God, the creator of the universe, is a good God. He dies for you. The shepherd dies for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. Look up here on the 
on the screen. John 15, 13, the greatest love you can have is to give your life for others. So when you look at the cross, whether you're wearing one around your neck or you see it on a hospital or you see it in the cemeteries or you see it wherever, Red Cross, whenever you see a cross, you just remember that is the symbol of God's goodness. It is the greatest symbol of the goodness of God. It is a picture. The perfect one dies for the imperfect one. Nobody has ever offered to pay for your sins except God. Nobody ever will offer to pay for your sins except God. When Jesus is dying on the cross, he didn't die from the Romans. He died love in the first degree. It was love, I love you this much. I'm willing to die for you, why? Because I am the good God and all that is good in the universe comes from me and all that is bad in the universe comes from when you reject my goodness and do what you wanna do. Here's the mind blowing thing. Not only did Jesus die to pay for your sins, that's good enough right there, but he has another thing he does. In that, there is a great exchange. He imputes his goodness. He puts his goodness inside you. He takes all the bad out and puts all the good in, in God's eyes. It's like blood transfusion. This is a great exchange. Look at this next verse in the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter five. God took the sinless Christ, he'd never done anything wrong, and poured into him all our sins. Jesus takes the guilt from every rape, every murder, every gossip, every lie, every molestation, every evil, every tax evasion, everything, everything done wrong ever in history. God took the sinless Christ and poured into him all our sins, all the sins of the world. Then, here's the unbelievable part, in exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. Are you kidding me? When God looks at you, he does not see your sin, he sees God's goodness. He sees the goodness of Christ. He takes all the bad out. He puts all the good in. This is the great exchange. Does anybody remember the name Monty Hall? <laughs> that was a TV show, Let's Make a Deal. Behind door number one, door number two, door number three, and you pick, let's make a deal. In the eternal, let's make a deal. There are three eternals. Open up door number one. You have sinned, you need to pay for it, go to hell. Ah. That's door number one. Door number two, you have sinned, you're gonna try to pay for your sins by doing some good things. Ah. You can't be good enough, doesn't work. Door number three, door's open. Jesus Christ says, here's the deal. I'll take all of your guilt, all of your sin, and I'm gonna give you all of my goodness. That's a deal. What a deal. This is the best news in the world, friends. It's why we grow Saddleback Church. It's why we start new campuses. It's why we do the peace plan, because everybody needs to know there's an exchange available out there, like a blood transfer. How about you wanna get rid of all the badness in your life and get all the goodness of God in your life, and then you go to heaven, which is a perfect place. You're not getting there with all your badness. You're only getting there with all of God's goodness. But it's already been paid for, and it's free. Why? Because God is a good God. What a deal. What a deal. Notice the next verse, Romans 4, 25. Jesus died for our sins and rose again, that's Easter, to make us right with God, and then here's the phrase, filling us with God's goodness. In God's eyes, God does not see any sin in your life. The one you did today, the one you're gonna do tomorrow. He doesn't see it, he sees all the goodness of Christ poured into you. If you were to die tonight, and you were to go to heaven and you say, now God, about that sin yesterday, you go, what sin? What are you talking about? Because it's all been wiped out. It's all been washed away. It's all been paid for. It's all been taken by Christ. You say, what sin? What are you talking about? All he sees is the goodness of Christ in you. That is the good news. That is amazing. Now, what in the world does what I've just talked about for the last five minutes have to do with prayer? It has everything to do with prayer. And if you don't understand what I just said, you'll never understand prayer. This is amazing. What God did for you at the cross makes prayer possible. Look at the next verse, 
Romans chapter eight in the Bible, verse 32. Since God did not spare even his own son, but gave Christ up for us all, he sent his son to die for the sins that you committed and I committed. Since God didn't spare even his own son, but gave Christ up for us all, won't he now also give us everything else we need? Do you see the logic of this verse? That when Jesus Christ died for you on the cross, he solved your biggest problem. Any other problem you have in your life is small potatoes. If Jesus Christ and God loved you enough in their own goodness, in God's goodness, to die for you, don't you think he loves you enough to help you with your bills and your health and your relationship? Everything else in your life is small potatoes. There is nothing you can't bring to God in prayer. If he loved you enough to die for you, he loves you enough to answer your prayer because he is a good, good father. Because God is always a good God. This is the hard one. You're not gonna like this one. I said God is good, so he always has a good plan for your life. And God is good because he always gives you what you need, not what you deserve. And God is good because he puts my good ahead of his own. But here's number four. Because God is always good, he does not say yes to every request. There's nothing in the Bible that says that everything you ask for, you're gonna get, no matter how self-centered or off base or whatever it is. God does not say yes to every prayer request that I, I make. We talked about this last week. No loving parent would ever give a child everything they ask for. You're not a vending machine. God is not your genie, he's not your magic wand, he's not your vending machine. Vending machine will give you stuff that's not good for you. God would never give you something that's not good for you. But what about the stuff that I think is good for me? And he says no to. Last week I told you that God always answers every single prayer. Not always the way you want, but you always get an answer. Remember I told you facetiously last week that there are four ways God answer. Uh, yes, no, wait, and you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> let, me, let me give you another way to look at this. I want you to write these words down. God answers every single prayer one of four ways. When the request is not right, God says no. God has said no to a lot of your prayer requests. And, and parents say no to their kids for a hundred good reasons. And God doesn't owe you an explanation for every time he says no to something you ask for. You'll know it when you get to heaven, but you're not gonna know all the reasons God said no. But no is an answer. So you didn't answer me. Yes, I did, I said no. That's an answer, no. So God says no when the request is not right. When the timing is not right, God says, this is a good request, but not yet. God says, slow. Write down that word, slow. No, slow. Slow means, I intend to give this to you, but not yet. The timing is not right. There's a big difference between a delay and a denial. No and not yet are not the same thing. Now, if you don't understand that, it means you're immature, because kids don't understand the difference between no and not yet. If a, if a parent says to a kid, not yet, they think it means no, and they have, a, they have a fit. Maturity is when you learn the difference between no and not yet. A delay is not a denial. So sometimes God says no, but sometimes God says, yeah, I'm gonna give this to you, but not yet, slow. It's gonna be a while. It might even be years, you don't know. Slow, God knows. Sometimes the request is right, and it's an okay timing, but you're not right. And God wants to do something in your life before he gives it to you. You're not ready to handle the answer because often his answer is a bigger one than you wanna get. And when God wants to give you something he's waiting on you, he says, grow. That's an answer. Sometimes God says, yeah, I'm gonna give this to you. That's a, that's a good request, that's fine. Uh, but you're not ready to handle it. It's like giving a little kid 
you know, travel luggage to carry into the airport. They can't carry it, it's too heavy. And so sometimes God's answer is, yeah, I'm gonna give it to you, but grow first. And once you grow up spiritually in that area, I intend, fully intend, to give this to you. Now when the request is right, it's not some self-centered thing, and the timing's right, and you're right, then God says, go. That's the fourth thing. All systems go. Green light. I'm going to give it to you right now. All four of those are legitimate answers. Many times God will say no. Many times he'll say slow. Many times he'll say grow. And many times he'll say go. This, this is it. I'm going to give it to you right now. But each of those are answers to God. Luke chapter 11. Jesus says this, verse 11 to 13. Your fathers... You fathers, if your children ask for fish to eat, would you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, would you give them a scorpion? This is obviously humor by exaggeration. Uh, Of course not. So, if you as sinful people know how to give good gifts to your own children, how much more will your heavenly father, who's a good, good father, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The point God is saying here is God's never gonna give you anything that'll be hurtful or bad for you. But he says, if you, being an imperfect parent, know how to give good gifts to your kids, and you do know how to do that, certainly God, who is the perfect and good, always good Heavenly Father, knows how to give good gifts to you, but he'll never give you anything that's not good for you in that moment. In that moment. Sometimes we ask things, we don't really know what we're asking about. One time, the mother of James and John, who were two of the disciples that Jesus picked, the 12 guys who traveled with him, she comes to him like a good mom. She's proud of her boys. They're traveling with Jesus. She goes up to the Lord and says, "Uh, Lord, when you get to your kingdom in heaven, can my boys sit on either side of you? I can just see a mom doing this. And John's going, oh, mom, come on. And Jesus, in Matthew 20, verse 22, Jesus replied, you don't realize what you're asking for. You have a limited perspective. You don't see the whole picture. You don't realize, ma'am, what you're asking for. Many times, God has wanted to say that to you. You don't realize what you're asking for. You don't really want that. What you want is something different. And so I'm not gonna give you this because you think you want this, but it's not really what you need. It's not good for you. It's not really even what you want. You don't realize what you're asking for. And in that point, when God says no, you need to go, I trust a good, good father than I do my own judgment. Because I think this would be good for me, but God, you got the bigger picture. And you, you can see my whole life in front of me. You don't know where this turn is gonna take me. I, I don't know, but you do. And if you say no to that job, or no to that engagement, or no to whatever I've asked for, I'm just gonna trust that you are a good father. Because you can see what I can't see, and I don't realize even what I'm asking for. As Garth Brooks said, thank God for some unanswered prayers. Now let's just be honest. It's easy to trust God's goodness when things are going good. No sweat. Everything's going good in my life. God is a good God. The test is can you say that when everything's bad in your life? When things aren't working out? When you're not seeing the changes? When you're not getting the answers? When it seems dark? When you feel alone or afraid? When things are not going good in your life, can you still say you're a good, good father? It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are. That is the ultimate test of your faith. And God is going to test your faith thousands of times in life. Do you trust your feelings? It's easy to feel good when God God is good, when things are good. Or do I trust the faith that God is good even when I can't see it? That the sun is still shining when I can't see it? The test of your faith is not how high you jump in praise, singing a song, when things are going good in your life. The test of faith is how straight you walk when everything sucks. And you're still going straight. I'm still trusting in the goodness of God. I did not get that job. I just got fired. I'm trusting 
in the goodness of God. That his plans for my life are good plans. God, I trust you. I don't see it, but I trust you. Ultimately, I'm gonna trust you. When things don't work out, when my wife got breast cancer, the month we launched the peace plan, I'm going, come on, Lord, we're trying to do something serious here. <laughs> this is for you. And the Lord's going, Rick, don't you think I know that? And I don't know if my wife's gonna die, and I'm praying for a healing. I don't care if it's by miracle or medicine, doesn't matter to me, just for healing. Don't wanna lose my wife. And month after month, I'm holding the, the bedpan while she vomits into it. And she's going through all this radiation and chemo and surgery. Is God a good, good father when your wife's got cancer? Yeah, yeah. When I have two prayers in my life that I've prayed every day for over 40 years and I'm still waiting for the answer, is God a good father? Yeah. Yeah, he's still good. When my youngest son lost his lifelong battle with mental illness that I had prayed every day, God would take away. And he takes his own life and he makes a permanent solution to a temporary mood. Is God a good father when your son commits suicide? Yeah. 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 He's still good. Not everything that happens in the world is good. Not everything that happens in the world is God's will. There are a lot of things God doesn't want to happen, but he's given us a free choice. It's your greatest gift and it's your greatest curse. Because he's not gonna force you to love him. Is God a good God in that moment? Yeah. The moment of ultimate test of your faith is when you can say, like Job, when you've lost everything, all your family, all your crops, all your business, all your health, you've lost everything, and Job says, you give and take away, you give and take away, but my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be the name. You're a good, good father, even when I've lost it all. I trust you. That is maturity. That's where God wants to take you. That you do not live your life based on your feelings, but you live your base life based on the truth. That God has a plan, and if I'll follow that plan, it's a good plan, and even the bad things that happen, God said, I'll, I'll fit that into the plan too. You know a lot of times when you pray for stuff, it doesn't happen. Let's just get real honest here, okay? Let's talk about this. Most or many of your prayers you have not seen the answers to. You know, this week um, uh, on Wednesday, I got a terrible stomach ache. I mean, it was bowl over in a fetal position and you can't handle it kind of pain. And I'm laying there, bowled over in pain, and I cried out to God, God, take away this pain. You know what happened? He didn't take it away. <laughs> Anybody ever been there on that one? He didn't take it away. And actually the pain lasted several hours longer. It eventually subsided, but he didn't take it away. Now, what does that tell me about prayer? That prayer doesn't work? No, I've seen it work too many times. That God isn't good? No, God is good whether I'm in pain or not. That God doesn't care? Of course God cares. That I should give up on prayer because I don't get everything I selfishly ask for every time? No. God is not a vending machine. He's not a genie, I said that. And prayer is not a painkiller. It is not a painkiller that takes away all of your pain. God is not guaranteed a pain-free life to you. That's called heaven but not here on earth. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God wants you to live pain free. Actually pain keeps us from many times getting into worse situations. 
Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God said prayer will make every single moment of your life easy. It is not God's job to make every moment of your life easy. You'd never grow up. You'd be immature, you'd be spoiled, you'd be incredibly self-centered. It just doesn't say that. So when I'm in pain and I pray and I don't see the answer, should I, should I give up? No. My job is to keep praying, to keep trusting God with the answer, because I know that everything he does and everything he allows in my life, he will use for good. And so I accept a no, or a slow, or a grow, or a go. Because I know that God is a good, good father even when I'm in pain. If a doctor does a surgery on you and cuts you open, that's gonna cause some pain. But if that surgery saves your life, it's a life-saving surgery. And you are in pain in the surgery and then you're in pain in the recovery, you say, that's a bad, bad doctor? No, he just saved your life. When God doesn't immediately end your pain, as he didn't mine, he was just saying to me in that moment, my grace is sufficient for you. Rick, you can handle a little pain in your life. You can handle a lot of pain in your life. I've had a lot of pain in my life. In fact, almost everything I've learned in life, I learned through pain. I've learned nothing from pleasure. Zero, zip, nada. I learned very little from success, but I learned boatloads through pain. And God is more interested in making me a man of God than he is in making me comfortable. God is more interested in making you a man of God than making you comfortable. He's God is more interested in making you a woman of God than making you comfortable. Comfort's gonna go on for trillions and trillions of years in heaven. But right now, you're in the grow up stage. And so not everything you ask for, you're gonna get. Otherwise, that's like Midas touch, everything turns to gold. If you never had any pain or difficulty in your life, how strong, how mature would you be? Not very. You don't know God is all you need until God is all you got. And then you realize that God does everything for good. Isaiah 55, verse eight and nine, God says, my thoughts are completely different from yours, which is why he doesn't answer the way I want him to many times. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And Rick, you're praying at one level and I'm thinking about your life at another level because I want good for your life even more than you do. Will I trust him? Okay, number one, number five, last one. Finally, because God is always good, he invites us to live with him forever. Are you kidding me? God wants to show you his goodness, not just while you're here on earth. God is going to show you his goodness forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever for all of eternity. Wow, because God is always good, he invites us to live with him forever. Two verses and I'll close. Second Thessalonians. Our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father who loves us has given us by his grace, his goodness, an everlasting encouragement. I'd say so, heaven's called an everlasting encouragement because it never ends. And a good hope, there's that word good, and a good hope that will last forever. Forever, circle that, forever. Now he says, may this encourage your heart, even when you're in pain, that no matter how much pain you're in, it's not gonna last forever, but heaven's gonna last forever. Joy's gonna last forever, hope's gonna last forever. May this encourage your heart and give you strength for every good thing, there's that word good, that you do and say. And God is good to us, he wants us to be good to other people. We did that entire series on Psalm 23 a year ago, and the last verse, Psalm 23, says this, surely goodness, surely goodness, God's goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, that's good, but then he adds this in, and then, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's a good plan. 
Why am I saying this? Why are we covering this at the very start of our small group studies? Because until you're absolutely convinced that God is a good God and that he's always good and that he never does bad in your life, if, until you understand the goodness of God, your prayers are gonna be powerless and passionless and pointless. On the other hand, when you realize no matter how I feel and no matter what it looks like, God is for me, he's not against me. God is a good God and he wants what's good for me more than I even want it myself. And he knows what will make me happy more than I know it myself. God is a good God. And that's the foundation of all your prayers. Now your prayers become passionate and purposeful and they've got a point to them. And you have power in your prayers. So let me ask you this. What do you wanna see happen in your life the next 40 days? I want you to commit the next 40 days to learning how to pray. I'm gonna teach you in the weeks ahead, both in the small group and here, how to pray effectively. But it starts with the goodness of God. Nothing's more important in your life than you learn how to pray effectively, friend. It's the way you tap into God's power, God's presence, God's peace, God's purpose, God's plan. It's the way you tap into all of that. So what do you wanna see in the next 40 days? Start thinking about that. You have not because you ask not, the Bible says. Satan is not afraid of your plans. Satan is not afraid of your schemes. Satan's not afraid of your budget or your strategy. Satan is not afraid of your programs. But he's scared to death of your prayers. Because that's where you tap into God. And he knows that anytime God wants to do something really cool, really great in your life, or in your family, or in your job, or in your community, or in your church, or in our nation, he starts by motivating you to pray. So if you're gonna commit to praying and learning how to pray the next 40 days, buckle up. Get ready for the adventure of your lifetime. We've just been through a time where we've had three major hurricanes. An earthquake in Mexico a church shooting in Nashville, and now the largest mass shooting in American history in Las Vegas. I've been consumed by these the last several weeks, helping hundreds of churches. The money that you gave, over a million dollars, we've been distributing it in the disaster areas to churches as they care for the people. I've been on the phone all this week talking to pastors in Vegas, coaching them on how to counsel the people, the difficulties. We had people in our area who died in Vegas only about 10 people were actually from Las Vegas, they were from everywhere else who died. Our nation needs a spiritual awakening. Our nation needs revival. Our, our nation needs God. Things happen when people start praying together. These last two verses on your outline, Psalm 119, I want you to pray this this week, this verse. Pray it every day. Verse 37 and 40. Lord, keep me from paying attention to what's worthless. You might write out next to that cable TV. <laughs> and social media. Lord, keep me. If you spend as much time checking in with God in prayer as you do checking your Facebook, you'd be a whole lot stronger. Lord, keep me from paying attention to what's worthless. Instead, let me live by your word. You need to get in a small group where you're gonna learn the word. I want to obey your principles. Please renew my life with your goodness. And then make this your prayer. Lamentation 521. Bring this back to you, God. You can pray this every day. Bring this back to you, God. We're ready to come back. Give us a fresh start. And as your pastor, I'm asking you to pray three things every day this week. Lord, revive my heart, revive my small group, and revive our church family. I want you to hear a song before we go. And as they come out, I'm gonna pray for you. Let's bow our heads for prayer. 
This song will sum up everything I've been trying to say. So I want you to stay and hear it. And then we'll leave. Father, you are a good, good father. There are many people here in pain. You're still a good, good father. We've all had prayers that weren't answered the way we want them to be answered. You're still a good, good father. Help us to remember that your plan for our lives is always good. So we choose your plan, not ours. Help us to remember that you always give us what we need, not what we deserve. Thanks for that. And thank you that you not only forgive us, but you pour your goodness into us. Thank you that you're not mad at us, that you're mad about us. Thank you that you amazingly put our good above your own good. And you did that through the cross by dying for the sheep. You didn't spare your own son, so you certainly give us what else we need. And Lord, even though we don't always understand it, we thank you that you don't say yes, go, to every prayer request. Your goal is not to make our lives easy, but to grow us up. We realize that your thoughts are not ours, your ways are higher than ours, and there's a lot of stuff we don't understand and we won't understand until we're with you in eternity. And thank you that you've invited us to live with you forever in heaven. If you've never opened your life to Christ, say, Jesus Christ, I want to accept your gift of heaven. I want to accept your gift of forgiveness. I want to accept your gift of a new life. Jesus Christ, I want a relationship with you. I want to put my trust in you. I pray, Lord, that in the next 40 days together, you will revive my heart and all of our hearts. You will revive our small groups, all of them. You will revive our church family. Only changed people can change the world. I pray this blessing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thanks for checking out this week's message on YouTube. We would love to get you connected with our online community. There's three easy ways to get you involved. First, learn about belonging to our church family by taking Class 101 online. Second, you can join an online small group or a local home group in your area. And third, check out our Facebook group to engage with our online community throughout the week. To take these next steps, visit saddleback.com slash online or shoot me an email at online at saddleback.com. I hope to hear from you soon.